precious Jesus, we look to you, Lord, because you're our help. And we need your help this morning. We need your healing in our bodies. We need your presence in our minds and in our hearts. We need your strength, Lord. We also need to hear your voice. We need to hear it loud and clear. We need to have ourselves adjusted for the future, Lord. I just ask Jesus that you would bless this spiritual meal, that we might partake of it, Lord, and in so doing, partake of your own spirit and your own fortifications, as it were, your own strengths. We bless your name. We thank you for all good things this week. Amen. The title of this morning's message is, Ye Must Overcome. Ye Must Overcome. Ye Must Overcome. <laughs> yeah. One of these encouraging, positive, uplifting, totally exciting messages with the intent to dazzle your ears, sparkle your eyes, and make you go away feeling like life is simple. Not. <laughs> On the other hand, neither is it a depressing, oh no, help us, oh God, we got to overcome, we're failing message. This is just a message to say, fact, ye must overcome. Fact, it has always been, ye must overcome. It matters not whether you're reading the Old Testament, the New Testament, or the current Testament. God's people have always had a fight on their hands. While the world goes bebopping along and building their pyramids and creating their monoliths and designing their world kingdoms and all the things that mankind has always done, generation, nation by nation. The saints have always had their share, too, fighting the good fight, standing up, right makes might, or that might makes right. <laughs> no, it's right makes might. The saints whether Old or New Testament saints, have always been of this world, not in this world, yes. Part of this system, not. Stuck in the system, yes. We have always found from the beginning, even until now, that we are trapped in mortal bodies, in mortal flesh, with a fireball of a spirit on the inside, and the ability to create out of our creative consciousness like God, and yet here we are, caught betwixt the two, wanting to do good, doing it not, knowing to do not and doing it not, <laughs> and always stuck in this middle ground. And yet, every day, we come a little bit further. The fact is, we are in a fight. It is a fight. And it doesn't always feel like a fight, but it is a fight. Second Timothy 4.7 says this, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I, I, I'm ready. <laughs> Imagine being the writer of the New Testament, two-thirds of the New Testament. Imagine writing to Pastor Timothy. Imagine giving instruction to the saints for the next 2,000 years. And the last thing you can say to them before you go out the door is, I fought a good fight. <laughs> now, what does that do to you? Oh, thanks, Paul, I appreciate knowing you did so well. <laughs> Why did you have to say that? Why didn't you say, I had a great Christian walk, it was a breeze. I had no trouble with demons. I had no trouble with sorcerers. I had no trouble with 
people who were trying to wipe me out, I had no troubles at all. I became a Christian, and, and that day when I got knocked off my horse, and finally, three days later, got my sight back and got filled with the Holy Ghost. I just had a great Christian life after that. It was a wonderful Christian life. I had no trials. I had no traumas. I just wanted you to know, guys, that if you serve the Lord, you get nothing but goodies. The table is loaded with dessert from here to the eye can see. And if it wasn't for you guys always making a mess of things, so I had to write epistles and fix it all, I mean, I'd have had a great life. At one point, Paul says, I really would like to go home now, but it's more needful I stick around for you. And then he ends it with, but I had a good fight. <laughs> now, you got to stop for a moment and say, uh, that was the apostle. That was the man who prob probably operated all five offices simultaneously. Apostle Paul... Evangelist who goes out and gets people saved, yanks them out of synagogues, builds churches around them, lays hands on them, gets them filled with the Holy Ghost, you know, summons in the Spirit. The man who, who well, the only thing he said he didn't do is he said, I didn't do baptisms. I did a couple. Just a few. I let other people take care of baptisms. It wasn't my calling. Not my thing to go stand in the water. No, he was already knee-deep up in, in battle manure. I mean, come on, why go stand in the water? You know, I mean, this is Paul. You know, I mean, this is our, our, our apostolic idol. This is, man, I wish I was Paul. You know, he says, I had wars without, I had wars within, I had enemies without, I had enemies within... I was shipwrecked, I got stoned, I got mugged, I got chased out of town like I was some kind of cheap cartoon criminal. I, every time I opened my mouth, there were people around arguing with me, disagreeing with me, trying to string me up in front of the magistrates. I mean, I just had a great Christian walk. It was just one blast. And so we offer to the new baby Christian, you know, if you come into the gospel... You, too, can have the perfect vacuum cleaner, the absolutely perfect tool of your trade, whatever it might be, your special saw, your special whatever, guaranteed for life, works permanently, no troubles will ever happen. I mean, we kind of sell the gospel like it's a wear. We kind of tell everybody what the guarantee is, what the... the uh, <laughs> conditions are, and how perfect it will be. Now, all you got to do is obey. I mean, that's all you got to do. You got to read the instructions, do exactly what it says, and you will not have to worry. And isn't that better than the life you're currently living? And you know, some people believe it and some people don't. <laughs> some people come into the Christianity and don't seem to skip a beat. The demons follow right behind them. Some people come into the Christianity and the relatives don't skip a beat. They chase right behind him. What are you doing? Why are you doing that? How come? What for? Why? How come? Paul said, I fought a good fight. You know, you got to understand, I, I bucked some Jewish leaders. I bucked some Roman leaders. I bucked some <laughs> Gentile leaders. I bucked some shipmasters. I, you know, I just had a really good fight. <laughs> yeah, let me tell you what a really good fight is. I'm alive still. They're not. <laughs> I went into the ring and the bell rang. Bing! Round one. Bing! Round two. You know what I mean? That's a good fight. You know? I wonder sometimes what it was like in God's corner when Paul crawled off in prayer. You know, like right after a stoning or right after a, after a shipwreck. You know, and he's talking to the Lord. Oh, man, I'm tired, Lord. What if he did an Elijah prayer, you know? This Jezebel, she's chasing me everywhere. There's no apostles anywhere in the land but me. You, come on, you don't think he didn't have a few pity parties along the way? <laughs> and have God sitting in his corner, giving him the water bottle of the Holy Ghost, you know, and wiping his brow a little. It's okay, Paul. Stick it out. Hand in there. You can do it. Next round. <laughs> you know? A fellow by the name of Dudeman was electrocuted seven times, and the first six times all the angels said was, stick with it. Oh, thank you very much. Just what I wanted to hear. A stick with it message. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's not easy. 
Triathlons are not easy. Wrestling matches are not easy. Oh, yeah, you know those wrestling verses we don't like talking about. You know, I come to realize in this message, the way it started out, it was just very simple. Ye must overcome. I'm tired, Lord. I'll admit it, I'm tired. Aren't you tired? Aren't we all tired? No, 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 of course not. We're not tired. When we go to church on Sunday, we have a wonderful time. We have a wonderful time. Singing and a-dancing for 15 minutes. A wonderful time. I mean, is, is, that, is that Christian walk? Is that spirituality? Is that perfection? Is that becoming unto a perfect man? And then we sat down and we listened to the preacher preach. And we got edumacated. Hmm. And that made us perfect man. We're done, right? It's over. Preacher preached. I believe what the preacher preached. All I got to do is do what the preacher preached. Now I'm going to be a perfect man. I'm a perfect man. Uh, got to get up in the morning. Oh, all those CDs look flat, man. I don't think I can listen to any of that Christian stuff today. I think I'm going to go... You know, I mean, there's better music in... In, in in the TV set, then, you know, I mean, I just, I don't know, it just seems to me that, <clears throat> and the flesh man speaks, and the flesh man talks, then the spirit man runs, and the flesh man falls, then the faith man, it's a fight, it's a fight, but you have to kind of realize that, you know, if it's, that's the way it is, then, next, <laughs> wait for the ringing of the bell, I guess. Where's the hope? Where's the hope? Cries the crowd. Where's the hope? Well, I'll tell you where the hope is. The hope is I'm going to teach you how to fight. <laughs> I'm going to teach you fingers to war. I'm going to teach you which way to turn. I'm going to teach you how to stand up and claim things. I'm going to teach you how to look for the sucker punch. I'm going to teach you some things. 1 Corinthians 9.26 Paul says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that beats the air. I'm a smart boxer. I'm fighting a good fight, and, and I'm not just sitting up here going, Get away from me, bad guy! Get away from me! When I was a kid, I used to, when I was a teenager, I used to see some fights. <laughs> as I'm sure we all did. And uh, even when you're, when you're little kids, you know, when you're, you're in your early 10s to 12s, and, you know, you have the backyard brawl that takes place. It's so interesting to watch kids fight. You know, they grow in their fighting capability, if I can say it that way. It's like they get out there and, and you know, they're going to fight. Next thing you know, these fists are just flurrying in the air. They're just hoping they're going to hit something, you know. They're, they're not, you know, getting in here with the, with the uh, I can tell I don't know many boxers, you know, with the, the Mike Tyson left or the... The whatever his name's right, you know what I'm saying. I mean, they don't get in there and calculate. Okay, I'm gonna punch him in the left eye right about now. No, it's <laughs> then you get a little older in your teenage years, and it's. <laughs> I watch. I remember. I keep thinking about this this week. Two women, two two teenage girls, who uh, just before school started. I think it was my sophomore year. Um, from two completely different cultural <clears throat> backgrounds, got into an argument, and oh, did they get into a fight? You know, and and the ones like this, you know, just flailing like this, and and you know, trying to scratch and trying to pull hair. The other one went like this. Pow! <laughs> pow! Pow! Then the other one got smart, realized I can't miss, I can't dodge those, so she threw herself at her, tossed her on the ground, and a wrestling match started. Of course, all the kids loved it, you know. It was great entertainment for teenagers, you know. But it dawned on me, even when I was watching that, two different methods of fighting. <laughs> do you scrap or do you fight? Do you know how to get out of the way when the, when the thing comes out of you? Do you just, get out of here, demon, get out of here. I'm going to rip your head out. I'm going to tear you apart, you know. Or is it precise? Is it flailing in the air fighting? Or is it precise get around your enemy and Smack him one fighting. You've got to ask yourself, how are you fighting? If we're supposed to fight the good fight, and we're supposed to overcome, then maybe we should kind of pay attention to what Paul said. He said, I fought a good fight. And one of the ways I fought a good fight was, I knew how not to hit in the air. 
I knew precisely where to lay a few punches. I knew what parts of myself I had to bring into subjection, verse 27. I, I kept my body under and brought it into subjection. I said, no, no, you don't. Up comes this strong monster of a whatever. Oh, no, you don't. Boom, 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 boom. Get back down in there. You know, play whack-a-mole with the flesh. <laughs> Make sure you catch it when it pops up. <laughs> he says, I did all that, lest when I preach to others, I should become a castaway. That's the end of verse 27. I made sure I fought a good fight, because I didn't want to be like some of the other members of the body of Christ that I've seen, who uh, became castaways. They became rejected. They lost the fight. They just slipped out of existence. Imagine you've been given the opportunity to be a joint heir with Christ, to be seated in heavenly places, to live forever with the King, and you're into your tenth round, and you just say, oh, the heck with it. Hit me. It's like, could you not have pressed through for one more minute? Two more minutes? You went up for 18 rounds already. What was five more minutes? Yeah, but see, perspective's everything. When you're fighting perspective on, on pain and length of time and ability and fuzzy thinking, have an effect. When we fight, we're supposed to fight wisely. Yeah, but I'm not so wise. I'm not, the, I'm not the smartest person on the planet, you know. And besides, the devil's a whole lot smarter than me. And, and I'm just not sure that I'm capable or qualified to win this fight. Good. You're on the right track. You have just spoken the first true, honest, and perfect statement you could have spoke. You aren't able to defeat the enemy. Did you know that? You are not able to. I'll tell you right now. Your adversary... The devil, as a roaring lion, running around, seeking whom he may, he may devour, has been doing it for a while. And his, dimin his minions have been doing it for a while. And they have you outnumbered, and they have you outplanned, and they know perfectly well which strings to pull on your subconscious, middle conscious, upper conscious, super conscious, <laughs> if there is such a leveling. They know exactly which memory to trudge up at the right time to be able to wipe you. They got it all figured out. Your enemy is as a roaring lion. He even knows how to scare you. Boo. Roar. Slay. He knows. And yet, for all of that, God said, overcome. Overcome. We're going to find that he's smarter than us, but he's going to find that God's smarter than him. Well, I had a verse. It's obviously the wrong one. No, it isn't. 1 Timothy 6.12 Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. before many witnesses, before clouds of angels, before saints of old, before your brethren. Fight the good fight of faith, Timothy. I fought a good fight, Timothy. I know what a good fight is. And I taught you what a good fight is. So fight a good fight. Stop just fighting. Fight a good fight. Rise up so that you can know how to defeat your enemy. You are in control of your destiny. Sorta. Of. You are in control of part of your destiny. God is in control of the rest of your destiny. You are going to be getting instructions. They'll be coming in the spiritual email Monday. You'll be getting a few more on Tuesday. You will be told how to fight. If you are not asking God how to fight and just trying to somehow do the generalized, I rebuke you, devil, fight, you're going to lose. If you're going to sit back and go, well, if I don't punch him in the nose, he won't punch me in the nose, fight, you're going to lose. If 
you're going to say, well, the devil has no power or authority over me because I'm a Christian. Fight. You're going to lose. You might get by for a while until he gets done laying his trap, his strategy, his wiles. He's a very wily coyote. He is going to design something for you. And you are going to go bebopping along through the forest of life, and you're going to say, what a wonderful life in Christ it is, until you hear the click. And the click is preceded, followed by pain, excruciating pain. I saw a picture one time, don't know remember where, of an animal that went through the forest and tripped a trap and got his foot in one of those manglers. It happened so fast, you don't hear slam. You see pain. Blinding, unexpected, don't know where it came from, assault. How did that happen to me? How did that happen to me? I just had, uh, I just heard of somebody I, I know who just had a 31-year marriage just break up. 31 years. I've know, known people who have had marriages for 44 years break up. I've known people who have been friends for 20 years. All of a sudden they get in one argument. One argument. And they, fine, that's the way you're going to be about it? I've had enough of you, that's it, I'm done. And the friendship dissolves just like that. Vaporizes. Vaporizes. They've been through blood, sweat, and tears, and they couldn't handle one disagreement <laughs> when it was the right trap. I know of a man once who was sitting in a service and heard a message on tithing. Heard one line out of the message on tithing. Blue, so angry, he said, that his face turned absolutely hot red. He never came back to church again, ever, to that church. How dare you do that? Boom! Just like that. Was doing just great all the way up till that moment. Just right up to that moment. And then, bam, cut off in the fight. Wandered, went to church here, went to church there, wandered. You know what I'm saying? The enemy says, oh, that's okay. That's okay. I'll let you live for a little while. No big deal. See, he knows, like a smart boxer, doesn't matter if you make it two or three rounds with him. Maybe even five or six rounds, you know. He's going to let you test your water on him. He, he's got time. It's on his side. <laughs> he's got time. He knows. God also knows. And God looks down and says, okay, I'm waiting. Are you going to come to me? Am I your coach or not? Do you want prophecy or not? Do you want word of knowledge or not? Do you want insight into what's going on that you cannot see or not? Do you think they're just pretty gifts? Do you think they're just jewelry to put around the neck of the body of Christ so we can all look so glowy? Is that what those nine gifts are for? Just decoration so that we all know, praise God, we have the finest jewelry on the Christian planet. I can prophesy. Whew. I get spiritual experiences. Whew. I am just so cool. <laughs> Yippee. Meanwhile, those armor verses over there, oh yeah, armor, yes, armor. Just obey, just obey the law, just obey, just if, as long as you obey. Mm -hmm. So what did the Lord tell you to do on Tuesday? Well, Lord, don't talk to me. I'm just obeying. Well, what are you obeying? Well, I'm obeying the book. Oh, good. Glad to hear that. Uh, where does it say on there that next Thursday you're going to be assaulted by one of your co-workers, you're going to slip up, you're going to swear, you're going to cast demons at them by accident, and how are you going to rectify that because it's going to damage your reputation for the next 15 years? Please tell me where in the book it's going to say that. Well, if I'd have just obeyed. Yeah, right. But you see, what you didn't realize was that the one, two, three, whack, that hit you in the nose was specifically engineered to make it so you wouldn't obey that verse. And because you weren't strategically ready to not obey, to disobey, I mean to obey, you disobeyed. <laughs> yes, it would be great if we could keep it in our head. Okay, what verse applies right now? Put a double guard on your mouth. Triple guard on your heart. Watch out for your ears. Look out for your eyes. It would be nice to know all that. You're supposed to be doing that while you're fighting. Cool. But if you're not 
listening to the coach. If you're not listening to the guy on the sideline, get that left arm down! What's going to happen? You're going to get hit. You're going to get knocked. I want you to understand that fighting is strategic. Fighting, God, from the very beginning demonstrated was strategic. It was never haphazard, maybe I'll just rebuke it, stuff. The text of our message, that was the introduction, that was free. The text of our message is going to be Exodus 14 and parts of Exodus 15. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus 14. Exodus 14. Israel coming out of Egypt, <clears throat> which we all know about, so we don't ever have to read it anymore. We've heard it since Sunday school. We know about Moses goes in and ten times to Pharaoh and plagues, and they come out. And they go out through the Red Sea, and they go die in the wilderness, and then they go into Canaan's land. We got the story, Pastor. What do we need to know anything more about that? Well, I would encourage you to go back and read your Old Testament stories to learn what it means to fight a good fight. Because there's a whole lot of old boxing stories in the Old Testament. <laughs> There's a whole lot of uh-ohs and mistakes and God fixing things and teaching things and we gloss over them in a way because we don't realize that that's all strategy we're being told. We make the mistake of viewing the film of the games that went before and we focus on the quarterback. We focus on the one guy that pulled it off. And we totally forget to map out the play that took place. There's a play in there. There's a very precise set of plays in here. It's very strategic. Well, yeah, God sends Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh. They argue. Let my people go. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. And it's over. Right? It's all just a bunch of ritual. It was all just a bunch of stuff that they're now supposed to remember forever. yippee ki Say. But the truth of the matter is, it was to show you how a God who runs the universe trains his people to war. And even make sure that he doesn't put them in circumstances they're not quite ready, ready for yet. But he's going to set them up. It's all set up. It's pure set up. Now you've got to understand something. Chapter 12 of Exodus is Passover. I'm going to start in chapter 14. Now we all know the types and shadows. Anybody who's been around for five minutes in Christianity knows the Passover is the type of Christ. The blood on the post is the type of the blood of Christ shed for us, for our salvation. All very great and wonderful, that is our Passover experience. While the world is going to have their kids knocked off one by one as the death angel goes through the camps, the Israelites are going to be nice and safe, tucked behind the type of the blood of Christ. The spotless lamb. The best of your lambs. They were supposed to eat that Passover with their shoes on, their staffs ready, their stuff packed. They were supposed to wait and then eat the Passover, ready to go. Because God was already laying the strategy of their exodus. That's get out of town. One of the things I like doing sometimes is I like trying to come up with a symbol for each book of the Bible so that I can kind of remember my books without getting them all mixed up. It's hard to remember your books in a row. I don't know, 30 years, I keep forgetting after a couple of months. All right, let's see if I can quote all my Bible books in a row. One, two, three, four. Ah, stuck on number 15 or 12 again. But I once a long time ago came up with a symbol for this book, The Exodus. Big, fat, green exit sign. 
posted right over Egypt. <laughs> this is the exit. Is <laughs> This is God saying, I'm going to get you out. Here's how I'm going to get you out. Ready, guys? The devil is the god of this world, and he's got it under lock and key, and Egypt's running the show. And they've been doing so for a while. You've been slaves. You've been trapped. You have been part of the world. You was taken into captivity. But I never said you weren't my kid. I never said I wasn't listening. 400 years, you, t you called out. I never said I didn't hear you. Excuse me. I never said, no, I'm not delivering you. What I said was, tick, 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 just about, tick, tick. I have to lay this strategy exactly right. I'm sorry, guys, but i got to get the timing exactly right. You are not going to see me throw that punch early. I'm not throwing it early. If I throw it early, the adversary is going to have advantage of you. I can't have that. So I'm going to make sure that... Ah, there we go. Moses is ready. Okay, that works. That good. Hey, Moses, want to be my mouthpiece? No, 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 no. Argue, 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 argue. Okay, fine. Aaron's your mouth. You're, you're, he's your prophet. You're me. Tick, 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 tick. Ready. Okay, time for the first fight. And there it goes. And off they go with the story we all know. Excuse me. <clears throat> However, now they're ready. The plagues have happened, except for the last one. They're prepared to go. The Passover's done. This is salvation. That day, they no longer were part of Egypt. You see, before that, they suffered with Egypt. They suffered the economic collapse of Egypt that took place from those plagues. They suffered the disasters that happened. They had the ripple effect, as it were, as God was arguing with the world system. Let my people go. No, let my people go. No, let my people go. No. And that argument was heating up, and the ripple effect through the water was rippling all the way through Israel. I mean, can you imagine going to work the next day after the second plague hit? See, you still had to report for work. You still had to go into the pyramid. They were going to let you just take the day off because frogs are everywhere. So you go to work at the pyramid, and there was the buzz, you know, and there's frogs everywhere. Hey, you, get that straw up there. Quit looking at the frogs. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm still a slave, I guess. When God gets done with his argument, he says, now I'm going to make the distinction. Now I'm going to say, here's the mark off. The mark off for the third bell. Ready? Bing! Now, shoes on, staff's ready, Passover's done. You are hereby saved. I have just saved you. I have rescued you out of Egypt. I have made a demarcation between you and Egypt. There's actually a verse, and I tried to find it again later after I blew past it. There's a verse somewhere around 12 or 11 that says, I'm going to do this so that I can show you that I have made a mark between you and Egypt. I've separated you now. Now it's different. Before you were all commingled, part of it, mixed up, I'm going to make a mark. When I make that mark, that bell's going to ring the next round goes. So, God says, all right, here's what we're going to do. Everybody out. Now, I want you to make sure that you, you get where I want you to go. And there's a passage in there, in, the, in like about chapter 13 somewhere, where he says, he was going to bring him up a certain way, but he said, no, if I do that, and I bring him straight into Philistia, they're going to see war. And they're not prepared for war, and their heart's going to be disheartened, they're going to run away. So I'm not going to do that. And so he gives Moses a different set of instructions. He says, now, nah, I can't have them do that fight yet. They're not ready for it. I could have brought them up the easier way. You know, that whole argument, all the archaeologists go over as to which way they traveled. I'll tell you which way they traveled. They traveled the way God figured would make them less scared. <laughs> Want proof? Here, verse 17 of chapter 13. came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war, and they return to Egypt. God will not put upon us more than we're able to bear. We've quoted that verse. But did we ever quote it from a strategic point of view? 
There's some demons that right now you can't handle. You can't handle the truth. There's some things that you're fighting against right now that are just exactly right for what you're fighting against now. And the other guy that's around the corner, mm, later. I had to discover once in a certain part of my time in my life that I couldn't handle 30 of them at one time. It doesn't matter what the scripture says. Sometimes you're not strong enough yet. I had to say, I'll handle one of you. They said, no, you can listen to all of us argue at you. And voices coming out of the sky arguing with me. I said, no, one of you. Today, I decided I'm fighting you. <laughs> you just hear the rumble in the demonic host when I had to do that. It was a lesson I had to learn. There's a time to fight the crew, and there's a time to take down just one. So God says, I'm going to lead you out, and I'm going to make sure it's the exact way to do this. I'm going to send you exactly to your victory. And we're all like, yippee! That's great! We're going there! Far out! <laughs> God's with us! The pillar of cloud's there by day, the fire by night. The pillar of cloud is with the people. We can see God is with us. Revival is here. It's great. It's wonderful. Mm. Chapter 14, verse 1. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before Pehahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal Zephon, before it shall you encamp by the sea. Here's my strategy. I'm going to put you in front of big body of water, instead of taking you up the short way, because I really don't want you to lose heart. <laughs> and I'm going to trap you right there. Why? For, verse 2, uh, for verse 3, For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. The wilderness has shut them I'm going to put you over there, so that they'll get cocky. <laughs> I'm not going to send you through the short way directly to where I'm taking you to the promise. Oh, oops, there's a type. Oh, no. You mean we don't get to go straight from salvation, boom, right into heaven? Uh, no. You see, the direct way would put you in direct conflict with some rather high powers and principalities in your Christian walk right off the bat that you're not quite ready for. How about churches? How about revivals? Oh, come on, surely, now we can go straight into the presence of God forever! Revival's here! Ta-da! And then the first sign of growling principalities, everybody, out of the church. First sign of a little bit of dry. The water seems to dry up in that lake right after you got to the revival. You know, that dry spell hits. What happens to the churches right after they see no water right after their great revival? Oh, guess moves up. God's moved on. I'm out of here. Come on, look at your Old Testament types. Look at your New Testament examples. Tell me they aren't parallel. They're just on microcosmic scales. Sometimes it's the individual. Sometimes it's the family. Sometimes it's the church. Sometimes it's the nation. Mm -hmm. But we all behave in the same pattern. We're <coughs> trying to fight a good fight, and we're not quite fighting right. Because we don't get the strategy. We don't know what to do with strategy. So God writes these Old Testament examples. He says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put you <laughs> between a rock and a water place <laughs> so that Pharaoh's going to go, ha-ha! Do you know that God later did the same thing again in type? He did. He allowed his son to be crucified. Yeah. Think about it. If the rulers of this world had known they would not have crucified Christ. He put Christ up against the sea. He gave Christ no way out. The disciples were trapped between religion and a dead Messiah. That's a trap, isn't it? Isn't that a no way out sign? Isn't that a shouldn't we go back to fishing sign? Isn't that the revival's over sign? Isn't that we better go hide in caves because they're going to start hunting us now sign? Yeah, God's real good at this. And why did he do that? Allow his son to be carried up like that. 
Because the devil said in his heart, Ha ha, if I can get the son, go read the parable. If we kill the son, the land is ours. Go read the parable. Sent servants, sent speakers, sent son. They said, if we kill the son, the land's ours. Mm -hmm. That's what the devil said. That's what Pharaoh said. That's what they always say. And always they're wrong. Because God says, I'm going to put that, that spot that doesn't look like it's overcomable so I can trap the real person I'm trapping. I'm leading him into a sucker punch. Jab, jab, drop your guard. Drop your guard. Now, drop your guard. No, Lord! <laughs> drop your guard. Goes to take a swing, and the next move is an uppercut from where he's not expecting it. He said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he shall follow after them. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. How do you do that? Simple. He sucker punched him. Ever seen somebody, when they think that, that they're really good at something, and they're about to win an argument, or win a fight, or win a whatever, that little glow that comes on their face, like, aha, I got him. You know, seen it in chess games, too. Aha, I've got you. <laughs> And you're going to come out with that last wham, because you're ready. You know you've got them this time. You've got them. I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts that the Egyptians, that the Egyptians, that the Egyptians, hello, that the Egyptians may know that I am Yahweh. Think about that. Who is he trying to strike terror in the hearts of? <laughs> to quote a line. You? No. Is he trying to put you up against the sea so that you'll tremble at your enemies as they corner you? No. Who is creating fear here? <laughs> the lion roaring to scare you. While God, while the lion of the tribe of Judah, while the heavenly host are all lined up in a row going, Oh, you want to play the boo competition? Here, let's do the boo competition. I like the boo competition. <laughs> seen kids at Halloween you know, running around, has boo, 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 boo. No, you ain't seen boo yet. I'm going to harden your heart so hard that you are absolutely convinced you've got me beat. You're going to move that chess piece on the board because you looked at it and said, now I've got him, mate in three. But you forgot about that little bishop I stuck in the corner back there, way at the beginning. You forgot about that rook I tucked away, way at the beginning of the game. You forgot about that, didn't you? Oh, smart, smart angel of death. I'm going to make sure the Egyptians know that I am Yahweh. Now, let me ask you a question here. Does it look right now like Yahweh is being respected on planet Earth? Does it look right now like the name of Jesus is lifted high and every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord? Doesn't look that way, does it? Does it look like the church is reigning in power and victory? No, actually, she kind of looks like she's starting to get cornered. She's starting to look like she's losing ground. There's going to be a lot of people backsliding, <clears throat> slipping away from the Lord, giving up, as all of a sudden, churches get confiscated. They're going to go, that doesn't make any sense. See, right now we're in a spiritual struggle, a political struggle, a natural versus spiritual man struggle. And right now, it's a lot easier to believe, yay, God is with us because the ten plagues are going in our favor, aren't they? But what and if all of a sudden, God says, I want you to go over against that sea. And he go, we go, wait, wait a minute. You mean we're not winning any of our battles in court anymore? And we're not, we're not, uh, we can't expand our church anymore because now they've got new coding laws that says we can't expand our church anymore? And, and now we have to build their pyramid with, with, with no straw? And now we've got to work 60 hours a week instead of 40 to make the same number of bricks? And uh, we're trapped. We are. We're getting there, just slowly, that's all. But the real goal of the Lord is, go ahead. I'm going to let the world think they're winning the argument. They thought they could fight me and win. They're going to build their tall buildings 
like Babylon, like Babel, all the way up to the sky. And they're going to defy me at the highest of their, um, what do they call those? Penthouse suites. They're going to get as high up to heaven as they can and have a cocaine party to stick it in my face. It's your building. Do what you want with it for now. It was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. The heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. Huh? <laughs> Why have we done this that we have let Israel go from serving us? Haven't you figured it out? The world just wants Christians to serve them. Haven't you figured out the world just wants servants? Matter of fact, haven't you figured out they want slaves? You know, labor is cheap when you don't have to pay for it. <laughs> Slavery all over the world occurs right now. Thank God I live in America and I'm not a slave. However, in a certain regard, I'm a slave in America. I don't get to do anything I want. But when the time comes where God starts yelling louder and louder, let my people go, let my people go, Egypt's going to start going, wait a second, who says you get to go to church? Who says you get to have that meeting in that neighborhood? Who says you get to have that? See, right now, as long as revival is quiet, they don't mind. They can even kind of turn a deaf ear to it and a deaf eye to it. But if all of a sudden, millions of Christians start operating in the power of God, if all of a sudden churches start springing up, and they've got Holy Ghost music coming out of every fiber, what happens if angels start appearing on top of church buildings singing Hosanna songs in the neighborhood? Mm -hmm. Ever thought that was possible? I guarantee you they're going to try and get us with a di disorderly disconduct, dis whatever. <laughs> it says he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. He took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. Do you think their military can't move in? You don't think the guys in the black suits with the plexiglass helmets can't show up on the doorstep? Do you really think it's your property? Do you really think you own the land that you're sitting on just because you're not in an apartment? Do you really think they don't have the ability to bring in more squad cars from somewhere and put captains over them? The motor pool is probably growing right now. Says the Lord... Hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh. All? Can you imagine what it's going to be like when the devil is cast to earth and he's so wroth with the woman that he sicks the whole world after her? Ow. I'm going to find them all. Every wicked government in history has gone after the Jews and the Christians. They have. Every one of them. They will allow Greek gods, Hindu gods, Buddha gods, but you know, it's just those Yahweh-based people that get the brunt of the fight. And it always looks like we're sheep led to the slaughter. It always looks like we're the ones taking the heat. And it's not any fun, I'm sure. It's not fun from the demonic. It's not fun, fun, fun from demonic people. But you have to understand, it's a setup. The whole thing is a setup. People say the book of Revelation isn't going to happen the way it's written. Why wouldn't it? When have you ever seen the Red Sea parted? Never happened before. When have you ever seen the kinds of assaults that the book of Revelation describe? It hasn't happened before. Our God is going to have to do a fight with the whole planet. Now, you know, he told us not to, because if my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight. 
He'd have us take up arms if we were supposed to be doing the fighting in the natural sense. So, what does God have left when he decides to start a fight? <laughs> Except the creation itself which he made. It's perfectly rational to see what Revelations is about. They've got missiles. God's got meteors. They've got laser beams. God's got the sun. Well, now think about that for a minute. It's all strategic. Every bit of it's strategic. Don't forget that God fought against Egypt with their own gods. Flies, frogs, you know, the things they respected the most. What's going to happen to technology when God says, oh, you trust in that instead of me? Be ready. We must fight a good fight. Ye must overcome. When Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and beheld the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid. I love Old English. Sore afraid. They were terrified. They were quaking in their shoes. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord... And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Oh, don't you just love being the spiritual one in the family? Don't you just love it when you say, The Lord gave me a vision, and one day all of you are going to bow in front of me? Don't you just love it when the Lord says, I called you to deliver Israel, and I'm going to deliver Israel with a very high hand? It's bad enough, you have to say to God, Yeah, but who do I say sent me? Because I'm not sure they're going to receive me. And after you get past all of that, ah, finally, they know I'm called, they know I've got the Word of God, they know that I've got the power of God, they know all that, ah, oh, that should bring some obedience and teamwork and unity, and everything should go just great from that day on, and this church will never have another problem. Right. Yeah. Why is that taking us out of Egypt? Why do you make us come to these church services? How come we have to have worship services? How come we have to have... Who put thou over us? Who said you got to run this place? Well, the Lord told me, go down to that town and raise up a church. Okay, so the Lord told you to raise up, didn't say you could keep it. We're just as good as you are, right? My name's, Mo my name's Miriam, his name's Aaron, we're prophets. What's your problem? Our council is as good as your council, is it not? In a powerless church? Yes, it is. <laughs> you got to understand, it's been the same arguments. Nothing new under the sun. Well, except for the powerless argument. <clears throat> That's kind of new. <clears throat> Stick out your hand and point at the prophet and see what happens. Nothing! Didn't I tell you so? When the day comes when we see a lot more of the real and the less of the fake, or the less of the pseudo, it's, it's just going to rattle everything. It's going to make life a lot more uncomfortable. So if you're kind of cowering behind your spiritual assaults now, get over it. <laughs> i got to get over it. I'm only preaching to my choir, <laughs> of which I am the head orchestra, head whatever, conductor. Right. i I got to tell myself to get over it. This is not fighting with giants we're doing right now. This is a healing here, a deliverance there, a a, a co-worker, a boss, uh, you know, Susie Q with the big mouth. <laughs> is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Didn't we have this conversation before? I told you so, Moses. We tried to reason with you. Don't try to do this. I'm going to deliver Israel with power thing. We told you that religion works just like it does, right the way it is. We got a great agreement with the Egyptians. We signed our union contract. We're doing our mortar just fine. We're having a little bit of trouble with some of the leaders. They're a bit harsh. And now for the intermission to the movie. Everybody go get popcorn and come back for round three.
Didn't we tell you, Moses? We were wiser than you. We had a council meeting before you did this stupid throwing plague stuff. I don't know how many times I've had to turn on the Christian radio and listen to them tear down somebody who's having manifestations in their church. Because they always say the same thing. Look at the fruit. Look at the fruit. In the end, it didn't do any good. We told you so. It would have been better if they had stayed uh, stayed denominational. It would have been a lot better if they had just never dabbled in that prophecy stuff. They would have been a lot better off if they just wouldn't have yielded to the Holy Ghost at all. That's the problem, see? That's the problem. They thought they could do something. They were deluded. Remember at one point God says to Moses, Step out of the well, wipe them all out and start a new nation out of you. What did Moses say? No, Lord. Lest the people say, You brought us out here in the wilderness to die. That was his argument with God. This is their argument with him. (laughs) This is the argument all the time. (sighs) When the water don't work, when the power doesn't come, when the church isn't right, when the music's not on, doesn't matter what church it is, it's always the same. What would you do that for? We should have done it different. We should have stayed where we were. I should have never come out of my church. I should have stayed a Baptist. I should, in fact, I think I'll go back to being a Presbyterian because that's where it was safe. Perfectly safe. I'm going to go back to being a Baptist, first class. I'll rise up in the Baptist, Baptist denomination because it was safe. Well, it really wasn't. Ask any good Baptist. He knows it's not safe. I was a Baptist. It wasn't safe. Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. No more forever? No more forever. You see, when God sets a fight, and he knows he's going to set up for the final punch, his ministers always say the same thing. Victory's yours. Fear not. <clears throat> and all the people go, uh, right. Uh, I'm stuck between water and a demonic host. And you're telling me everything's just fine. Pollyanna preaching, if I ever heard it. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what we'll be going through. Verse 14, the Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. (laughs) That's a nice, polite way of saying, shut up. (laughs) Shut up. But notice that phrase, please. Put it neon in your brain. The Lord shall fight for you. Paul said, I have fought a good fight. And because of that, we get the idea that he somehow was super Paul. He was an apostle. Of course he fought the good fight. He obeyed so perfectly that he never fell. So because of that, he had the anointing 24-7. Angels surrounded him because he fought the good fight. Don't you get it? He fought the good fight. It was his good fight. Somehow I get the feeling, when we get up to heaven and have a little talk with Paul, he's going to go, yeah, I did fight the good fight. I called on the Lord in Troas. I called on the Lord in... <laughs> My brethren laid hands on me and prophesied, and I followed what I was told to do, except for that time when I didn't follow what I was told to do and got myself in a bit of trouble. But overall, I fought the good fight. <laughs> the Lord shall fight for you. Quit fighting your battles so much. Don't sit back, though, and take the spiritual Pollyanna point of view. I don't got to do nothing because life is grand and God's going to rescue me. Because I don't pray and I don't obey and I don't think and I don't strategize with him. And I never get in his council meetings. (laughs) What are you not doing in his council meeting? Why aren't you in his council meeting? Do you know that you're called Elohim? Do you know what that means? Jesus knew what that meant. The psalmist knew what that meant. Do you know what that meant? You're supposed to be on the council meeting. <coughs> you, God, angels, having a powwow over your next move. And your move after that. And your war plan after that. As my wife's been quoting to me lately, uh, the Yumum and the Thumum. 
you know, the UT of the Old Testament. You're supposed to ask the Lord whether to go up to fight or not. You're supposed to ask the Lord whether to sit still or not. If you're going to fight a good fight, you should know how to consult your oracle. You're supposed to be the oracle of God. You're supposed to be the mouthpiece of God. You're supposed to have these nine gifts operating, church. You're supposed to have everything functional. So that you be children of the light and do not stumble in the dark. You have the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, so you don't stumble in the dark. But you still have to have the strategy. You still have to know the moves. God looks down at Moses right after Moses gives this great sermon, you know. See the salvation of the Lord. Sit down, shut up. Great sermon. I think all preachers should end their sermons with, sit down, shut up. If it's an anointed sermon, usually people feel it whether he says it or not. <laughs> the Lord says unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? In another passage, he says, in the parallel story of Exodus and Leviticus, I think it is, Moses goes, What do I do? <laughs> says to the people, That's right, watch and see the salvation of God. Then he goes to God and goes, What do I do? <laughs> oh, come on. All preachers do that. <laughs> our job? Tell you what to do. No. Our job? Tell you the truth. But then what do we do? We've got to go back into the closet. And God usually says things like this. Wherefore cries thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. And just stop right there at that sentence. This is your strategy, God, right? Let me see if I get this right. Stick me between them and water and then tell me to go forward. But you forgot one thing, God, in your strategy for me fighting a good fight. Did you get me confused with Noah? <laughs> You didn't tell me to build no boat. If you wanted me to load them into an ark, why didn't you say so? No. God's not confused. He knows what Moses means. I drew you out of the water. Hmm. Already had a water relationship with Moses. He could have made him float on a boat. He'd already done it once. No, this was going to be a different water experience for Moses. You can find it, you can watch the whole story of Israel. They play with water all kinds of times. <clears throat> There's types and shadows hiding in all of it. But this, this water experience <coughs> is going to be, go forward. Go forward. Forward. Which way is forward? <laughs> Towards the water. Catch the type. Toward the water. He didn't say... Turn your armies around, face them towards the pillar of fire, and start marching towards the Egyptians. Walk in the Spirit and you will in no wise fulfill the cravings of the lower nature. The Spirit man will down the flesh man. But what you don't know is how. It just says he does. What you're seeing here is exactly that. The Spirit man making a decision that's going to end up drowning a whole bunch of flesh men. Demonized men. They had to head straight into the type of God and away from the battle in order to win that battle. They weren't warriors yet. They were a bunch of brick builders, sheep herders, pitchfork dudes, you know? Lift up thy rod. Uh, could you please exercise that gift I gave you? The power gift, in this case. Would you please do that? Lift up your rod. Lift up Christ. If I be lifted up. Lift me up, please. Stretch out thine hand over the sea. Oh, Great, now we're going to go command oceans. Now we're going to go walk on water. Great, another walk on water story. Great, what is it with God and water? And divide it. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Now, imagine for the moment, if you would, corporation waterlog out there in the middle of the ocean. And God says to that commander, divide the waters. Do you realize how many pumping engines it would take to move that water? 
Do you realize how many tons of water that is? Do you realize that in order to do that, you really got to be skilled? <laughs> what happens when a big body of water meets one gift? According to this strategy, the water moves. Contrary to nature, contrary to reason, I guarantee you the History Channel and the Science Channel are going to have a hard time with this story because it violates the laws of physics. We must either make the water ankle deep or we must make the water not there. They went up by another way. Or we must just assume that it's a parable or a fable because we all know that scientifically the laws of nature are absolute. Push water, it surrounds you. <laughs> Throw your rod at it, you lose your rod. Walk your people into it, it's called mass suicide. And we call you Jimmy Jones. <laughs> but if God be for you, what water be against you? If God be for you, how much Holy Ghost do you need? He didn't say point your rod at the Egyptians and watch them all get slain in the Spirit. He didn't say point your rod at the demons and they will flee. He said, let me set up a strategy so I can drown them. Because I want to make sure that you will not see them again forever. When I say I'm going to set up deliverance and what I want you to do is get really, really anointed because the anointing breaks the yoke, it's because I want them gone forever. I don't just want you to drive them back and two weeks later he gets to come back with ten more. I want to wipe them out of your life. I don't just want them to go into hiatus, hibernation, show up 25 years later and do it again. I will harden the hearts. I'm sorry, back up half verse, I wasn't done. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Where there is no road, he makes a road. In fact, he makes a very wide road, because it had to be suitable for, what, two and a half million people, I figure? Two and a half million people go for a walk. You've got to stop and wonder... How wide was that road? You know, a lot of times when you see it in the kiddie stories, there's, you know, just enough for four people to go through. And they're running like crazy. But you see, there was, what, 3,000 chariots? I don't know, 600, 600 chariots. Now, if you know anything about chariot fights, <clears throat> they don't run one behind the other. <laughs> they run in rows next to each other. Partly for the horses. So when they decided to come attack Israel, they were in rows. And that means there was a whole lot of soldiers behind that. And it was one very big wide trap against one very big wide water. And the only reason they hadn't moved in was because that pillar thing was a bit of a fear to them. Mm -hmm. They were waiting. So, when God parted the water, just how far back did he have to recede it? to make dry ground. The point is, in your life, what size road do you need? What size road do you need? Do you need God to just give you a bypass? A quick run around the mountain so you can get away from him? Tunnel through the mountain? Move the mountain? What do you need? Hmm? <clears throat> you must overcome. Not overcoming is not an option. Going back into Egypt isn't an option. Serving under Pharaoh is not an option. You must overcome. So it really boils down to then just, what's it going to take? And God is the one who knows what's it going to take. He says, the Egyptians shall know, I'm sorry, verse 17, Behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. How many times do they have to say that over again? I'm going to harden their hearts. going to harden their hearts. By the way, I'm going to harden their hearts. I'm going to harden their hearts. You, you know what that does to us when we see that in human potential? When somebody was mad at us, now he's really mad at us. Now he's very mad at us. That's called hardening of the heart. 
Every day that person gets angrier, meaner, nastier, schemier. Is that a word, schemier? <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? That's called hardening of the heart. These Christians. At first it's a simple, I disagree with their politics. Then it becomes a, these guys are getting in the way of our, of our government. Then it becomes, kill Bush. Then it becomes, we'd be better off if we wiped them all out now. Then it becomes, we are going to wipe them out because they're getting in the way of our global community. And then it will be, kill them all, crucify them, crucify them, crucify them. That's hardening of the heart. We see hardening of the heart and we assume God's not busy. We see hardening of the heart and we assume God's not answering prayer. We see hardening of the heart and we start thinking, maybe I'm witnessing to the wrong dude. <laughs> At what juncture does a heart, hard heart turn soft and another hard heart turn hard? When the Lord says duck, and then the heart's too hard. <laughs> he says, keep talking. Might be a fighting chance, or just might not have come to full fruition yet. But the point is, God says over and over, I harden the heart of Pharaoh. And yes, it is true. The scriptures also say Pharaoh hardened his own heart. He did. But you know, quite frankly, I don't know about you, but have you ever been bullied when you were a kid? I did. I was. Bully comes up, pushes me. That's Monday. Bully comes up, pushes me. That's Tuesday. Bully comes up, pushes me. That's Wednesday. It happened in my life. I was in eighth grade. I let him get away with it for almost two months. Kicking my chair out, destroying my homework, yada yada. Put up with it. Didn't want to fight him. He looked bigger than me. And one day, he didn't realize what happened to me. I had hardened my heart. <laughs> to kick his you-know-what. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I come flying out of a chair, unexpectedly, in class, pin him to a wall in front of everybody, and they're like, he did that? No way! <laughs> That's right, because all human beings are like that. You push them, you push them, you push them, they will make decisions. Every day I made a decision. No, not going to fight you. No, nope, not today. No, nope, not today. Not today. Not going to do it. Not today. I had a case when I was older, worked for Safeway, and somebody found out I was a Christian, and I didn't know it. They were persecuting me to test me, pushed me, pushed me, pushed me. I kept finding myself wanting to say certain things with the person. God said, don't. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He pushed me again. Next week, he pushed me again. Next week, finally, I snapped. Whoops. I started to say the thing I wasn't supposed to say. He turns on me, looks at me, he goes, I knew you were a hypocrite. I knew it wasn't real. I crawled off in a corner and bawled before God and said, Sorry, you tried to tell me what the strategy was, but I didn't listen. Because it hurt because he was pushing me and picking on me. <laughs> but the whole point was he was trying to get that heart. Oh, gosh, if we could just get that point. We could just see what's going on. We can just understand that maybe it's not our boils that are the issue. It's the contest between Satan and God. You know what I'm saying? The Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh. Hmm. Why? Because I'm going to take their chariots and their horses and I'm going to give them a bath. That's why. I have a strategy, see Moses? I got a strategy. <laughs> He says, when I have gotten my honor upon Pharaoh and upon his chariots and his horsemen. And the angel Lord, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. Plan B, about to enact itself, came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. It was a cloud of darkness to them. Cloud of darkness to them. How black was that darkness? I wonder what that darkness was like right after Christ died and it says and the sky went black. I wonder what it was like when the lights went out in Jerusalem. Sounds like a song, doesn't it? The lights went out. <laughs> and it came between them and it was darkness, but it gave light by night to the other guys. 
What a wild, wild strategy. You like darkness? You get darkness! My people like light. I give them light. Don't you see the strategy? Step into the light. Step into the light. So that the one came not near the other at all that night. I don't even want you talking to each other. Because, you see, I got, a, I got water to move. <laughs> and I really can't have your faith distracted right now while I prepare the next scene on stage Earth. Ready, guys? Curtains! Pull the water back. Bring on the stage. Flatten and dry the ground. Get it ready. Act four. <laughs> if you don't see that the way to fight a good fight is to go through every stage setting, you miss the point. You must overcome. We got to get to the epilogue. We got to finish the play. The names may change, the masks may change, <coughs> but the actors are always the same. <laughs> Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. Why do you have to tell us about east wind? Who cared? It made the sea dry, and the waters were divided. Well, that was no big thing for God. He'd done dividing waters before, hadn't he? Dividing waters was his thing, remember? Genesis 1, dividing waters, not a problem to God. Won't he prove he could do it? And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right and on their left hand. Uh, it's wet. Now, come on, you don't think that those, those little kids that were running on that walkway weren't going, poke, 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 running their fingers through it, trying to hit the little fish on the way by? Come on! Don't you tell me they didn't. Of course they did. Now, their parents were like, hurry up, Moshe, hurry up, we got to get through here, quick, hurry up. Yeah, Mom, but it's, it's, it's cool. <laughs> God even entertained them. He gave them widescreen TV to go through. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you've got to see your battles a little more humorously. Maybe God's going to give you a vision or two on either side of your dry walk. You know, a little bit of reminder that everything's okay. Show you a little bit of heaven on screen one and a little bit of future on screen two. But keep those feet moving because those spiritual experiences, they're not designed for you to sit down, pull up a chair, open up the lazy boy, and get popcorn. They're part of the strategy. I don't know how many times I've had to go back and look at some of the visions God's given me when I was in my 20s to understand what I'm doing in my 50s. And that'll be your problem, too. <laughs> because the strategy is the strategy. And ye must overcome. <coughs> Excuse me. Egypt pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea. All Pharaoh's horses, chariots, horsemen came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire of cloud. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's funny. Our God's funny. Got this swirling mass of fire and stuff, and the angel of the Lord in the middle of it. That's what I said earlier. And all of a sudden the angel kind of peeks out, looks down at the army down there from way up in his high pillar. Yep, they're all just about in. Uh, i got to wait for that slow chariot over there. He never was very fast. <laughs> Last guy in. Train leaving. Hurry up. Come on. Get in there. There, that, there you are. Last guy out the other side. Yep, there goes that last kid. He, good thing his mom grabbed him so he wouldn't poke that fish one last time. <laughs> okay. Bell. Ring. What? Oh, you just got to understand that these demons that you're fighting think they've won the war. They think that every time they get you cornered, they've won. They think you're going to turn around and fight them. And sometimes God will tell you to fight directly. And other times he's just going to go, eat my dust. <laughs> but look out for the water. Demons don't like the Holy Ghost. They don't like the type of water. It drowns them. Would you like it? They have bad, bad water experiences in Scripture. Lots of bad water experiences. They lose every time they get in a water experience. I'm being a little humorous here. 
But the truth of the matter is, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water, and what do you think it's for? So you can hand out cups of it? Here, I've got a gift. Here, would you like some anointing? Here. What do you need rivers of living water for? You can only drink a cup at a time. You only need so much to live. Ah, but you see, if the water's coming out so abundantly that it drowns your Egyptians, now that's water worth doing something with. Well, I don't know if I have time to pray in the Holy Ghost. Oh, you have time to listen to them instead? Wouldn't you rather hear gurgle, gurgle, gurgle? <laughs> you and your sins, your sins, your sins. What sins? A little, a little, a little. Troubled the host of the Egyptians. Took off their chariot wheels. I, that's one of my favorite passages in the scripture. Always has been. Took off their chariot wheels. Now, I don't know. Maybe it was the mud. No, wait a minute. It was dry land. It wasn't mud. A lot of people assume that they got stuck. Well, maybe the water was starting to come back. Maybe it didn't just go, excuse me, but I'm going to make an accordion out of you. Splat. Maybe it came back like this starts coming in from under your feet. Your wheels get stuck. You're now up to your ankles. You're an Egyptian. You're looking forward. You're mad as a hornet. You're going to get those those guys. And then you start seeing water come up your knees. And you're halfway into this thing. And you're looking at the fish like the kids were. But you're not poking it because that doesn't make any sense. And that does... And, and wait a second. Which god was that that runs the water anyway? And what is that staring at me? It looks like one of my gods. No, that can't be right. I hate these guys! I'm going to kill them! Or was it just a very simple, God says, okay, I need you guys to stand still and quit running for a second so I can get the point across, because you're not listening. And so the angel of the Lord swoops down and goes, all right, guys, host out, move! And all the angels of the host, because remember, it's a very wide thing, just run from the backside where the fire was, out of the pillar, and go, pull off wheels. It's kind of funny, don't you think? Maybe it was just the anointing of God. Poof, all the wheels off. I don't care what it was. It's very disconcerting to the enemy when their perfect little plan all of a sudden is dismantled. Just like that. Just like that. He took their wheels off. So they, dra so they drave them heavily. Good old English. They drave them heavily. They drugged their chariots. They were so mad the horses are still trying to keep going without wheels. They're carving up new ground. I can't wait till the archaeologists find that body of water, get to the bottom, and see all those tracks down there. It's going to be a great discovery. I'm kidding. They said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. Oh, a little too late, guys. Should have listened sooner. You see, sometimes when you say to the people who persecute Christians or argue with Christians, and they think they're winning their, <coughs> their um, religious slash political arguments, and you say to them, You don't want to argue with me on this one. Yes, I do. No, you don't. Yes, no, yes, no. You don't understand. If you're arguing with me on this one, you're going to lose. No, yes, no, yes, no. And all of a sudden, one day, they're going to go, uh-oh, we shouldn't have argued with this one. And it's going to be too late. Because they already have been given ten chances. Ten. Ten chances. Plus one. Most people don't catch it. There was the plus one. What Egyptian, what person, what of any of us, in our right mind, if we knew they were trapped against the sea and watched them walk on dry land in the middle of water, what idiot follows? <laughs> Thinking that you're going to overcome them. Do you realize how absolutely demonically induced those Egyptians were? The hatred, the anger, the irrationality, for them to be stupid enough, hard of heart enough, to go into walls of water, chasing after people who somehow got walls of water, don't you think at least one Egyptian would have enough common sense to go, I'm walking backwards this way. That don't look right. My stomach and conscience say, I don't think that's smart. They, they were like lemmings. They went... 
pell-mell into it. Demons are smart. Demons are crafty. Demons have strategies and plans. But the problem is they also have dark thinking. And dark thinking has a disadvantage to it. I'm going to kill him, I'm going to kill him, I'm going to kill him, I'm going to kill him. Smack! Right into the glass panel. Because they don't see it. They're so self-consumed. They are so covered with their own hate. They are so scheming. Their brains are so busy planning that they're not looking in their rearview mirrors as they change lanes. <laughs> they are distracted while demonizing. And they run right into where they don't want to go. They crucified Christ, which they shouldn't have done. They went after Egypt and got wiped. The demons in your life are going to chase after you. The demons in your life are going to try to haunt you. The demons in your brethren are going to try and chase them. But you don't understand. As soon as you step into the ring under the strategy, the strategy of your captain, these guys are eventually going to lose because they're so wrapped up in the game they can't see the pieces. If you can accept that, you'll go to God more quickly to get your strategies knowing that they have to be defeated by the end of it. God's goal, he does not want them in your life at all. This is how we overcome. This is what we do to overcome. One strategy after another. One prophecy after another. One leading after another. One minor obedience after another. One repentance after a disobedience after another. Because you must overcome. You must overcome. Stick with me just a little longer. So, they go. They drown. Israel walks on dry land. Verse 30. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. Ooh. Now, that's a picture I always forget. I always forget they got drowned by all that body of water and then you didn't see them anymore. But now you've got to look at the mess. In the Battle of Armageddon, when it's time to start the next round, the place is going to be loaded with dead bodies. Why? Why don't we have missiles vaporizing them at that point in time? You ever asked yourself the question in, the old, in, in these passages about the end time fight? Why it isn't we just don't have a bunch of vaporized people? Why do we have all these descriptions about horses and horses' bridles and bodies and all this? I think the answer is right here. Same answer. I want you to see your enemy dead. I don't want you always in your brain thinking they're going to come back tomorrow. I want you to know that they're not coming after you anymore. Imagine yourself. You were a slave in Egypt. And you go walking up to that shoreline, and there on the ground in a dead carcass is the guy that spit in your face week after week after week saying, There is no Yahweh. If Yahweh was here, where is he? If there is a Yahweh, how comes he hasn't taken you out of my control? How comes he hasn't taken you out of my pyramid? There is no Yahweh. There is no Yahweh. There is no Yahweh. Imagine the terror that used to be erased by the sight of dead bodies. There is something that happens in the human mind when you know somebody's dead. Your brain just seals off that history. If you don't know they're dead, you always wonder where they are out there, don't you? How many people do you ever wonder where they are out there? People you grew up with, people you went to college with, people that were family members that haven't talked to each other for 20 years. You're always kind of aware that they must be out there somewhere, right? And you always wonder... I wonder what ever happened to so-and-so. But when you find out there's a dead body, you walk up to a casket and you look it in the face, it's over. It's done. <clears throat> when God gives you victory over the demons you're fighting, when he gives you victory in other people's lives and they become saved, spirit-filled, and they're walking with God and those demons aren't there anymore, and you get to see them walk in newness of life, you also get to see the dead body. Why do you think God gave us the dead body analogy in the first place? <laughs> Ye are dead, buried in baptism. Look at the body. Don't you get it? When you look at the dead body, it means it's not coming back. Oh, wait a minute. That's not possible. That can't mean that. Of course it does. Reckon yourself dead. 
unto sin. Look at the body. Dead sinner. Dead. Drowned. In the water. <laughs> no types here. <clears throat> if you can do that, you can rise up to newness in life and walk without fear. Because you can honestly say in your heart, what sin? You can understand my pastor's corner story that I wrote for this week. What mistake? What are you talking about? As long as we can still look back and we think we got a live flesh man chasing after us, we got the wrong picture in our head. The Egyptian is dead. Yeah, but I still sin. I still disobey. I still, I still. Mm-hmm. And what mirage are you following in the desert? The righteous man stumbles and gets right back up again. He's not carried down by no dead body. Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Well, I'm glad they got past that murmuring, arguing, and we should have been back to Egypt then. Now we get it, Lord. Oh, now we understand, say the disciples. Now we get it. You were going to raise after three days. Now we get it. You know, back then, that three days period, that was a bit rough, man. We thought we should have gone back to fishing. But now we get it. I didn't understand, Lord, the strategy. I, under, I, I get it now, okay? Thank you very much for delivering my fanny out of the fire. Gratitude and worship follows after that. When you get it. The Song of Moses, they said, sang the Song of Moses, and the children of Israel sang unto the Lord, saying, spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown in the sea. Yahweh is my strength and my song. He is my salvation. He is my God. I will prepare him a habitation. My Father is God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host as he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, has dashed to pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. That's why we will have a good fight. When they chose to fight him, they made a big mistake. And to fight us is to touch him. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. The blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright as a heap. The depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow them with thy wind. The sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? And so we could keep singing more and more and more of that song. Because the truth of the matter is, that's what praise is all about. That's what worship is all about. That's what we're for. That's why we do what we do. Joshua 23.10 says this, One man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God, he it is that fights for you, as he has promised you. Revelation chapter 2 and 3. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times. Seven times in 2 and 3 and one time in 21, 7. Say, if you overcome, I will give you... And he names a different object each time. If you overcome... Here's the rewards you're going to get for overcoming. But then if you go read the rest of the book, it boils down to, and if I help you overcome, <laughs> book of Jude, unto him who is able to keep you from falling, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If you understand that all your rewards are already waiting because God already knows what the fight is he wants to do for you, if you understand that once you get that, that inside scoop, <coughs> You know that insider trading deal in the spirit where you know exactly which stocks to invest in and which ones to let go? Once you understand the inside scoop, you're an insider. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse 4 before that, this is 1 John 5. Whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world. 
even our faith. We overcame the world because we believed the strategy. That's what faith is. It's believing what God says will be, should be, and can be, as long as you will be. <laughs> Ye must overcome. Revelation 15, 2. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name. They got the victory over him. Matthew 18, almost done. Matthew 18, verse 22. Nope. Skip it. Wrong verse. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 58. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Excuse me. <clears throat> For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass a saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks to be to God, which gives us, gives us, the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that you labor, as, as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The fighting is not purposeless. It all has purpose. The, the only catch is we have to see what that purpose is. We have to know that what we're carrying out is a plan that is absolutely destined to bring us to absolutely where we're supposed to be. There is no question about that. Second Thessalonians 3.13 says, Brethren, be not weary in well-doing. I would say be not weary in fighting either. Don't allow your guard to drop and your hands to go slack. I'm saying it to myself as much as I say it to you. Because that's the tendency after you've been in the fight a while. When you're a first-timer and you're coming into the ring, you're kind of fresh, you're pepped up, you're pumped up, you're excited of your Christian walk. You get about two, three, five, ten years down, depending on your stamina. Depending on how much of your Christian walk you were doing in your own strength anyway. And you're going to start feeling this weary, tired thing. You're going to feel like, oh, what's the point? And how come? And what for? And why did I do it? Was it ever worth anything? Galatians 6, 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. We will reap a victory if we don't faint, if we don't let go, if we don't just kind of keel over and go to sleep. Our biggest <clears throat> chance of failure is our own exhaustion sometimes. I'll have to admit, exhaustion is a tough thing to whip. But we can whip it. Revelation 5, read verses 6 to 14 when you get a chance. 6 to 14. The only point I'm going to make out of that is, they overcame them by the word of the Lord and their testimony. Got this big thing going on. Same scene. Doesn't matter whether it's on a global book of Revelation scale. Or whether it's on a personal individual scale or a national Israel scale. I gotta throw one more PS in here. This week I was watching a History Channel piece, I think. I turned in by accident. They were talking about the Israel the, the Israel coming into its own and winning the wars, you know, the forty eight and the sixty seven. Bottom line scene they described. A bunch of guys up on a hill running out of ammo. Israelites running out of ammo. This guy said, I have three bullets. This guy said, I had six bullets. The guys coming up the hill to, to take them were in great number compared to the few six guys on the top of the hill. 
They shot, they fired, they defended themselves, they ran out of bullets. This was the testimony I listened to. All of a sudden, the other side gets the idea. Hey, they've run out of bullets! We've got them! And they start charging the hill. Then they stop. Then they scream. Then they turn around. Then they run away. X period of time later, Medic talking to some, well, ends up talking to one of the guys who was there, according to the history thing, and said, why'd you run away? And they said, did you not see the big man standing behind you? We thought Abraham came to rescue you. Okay, so their concept was messed up. But when they'd run out of bullets, all of a sudden there was something very, very, very big back there protecting these guys. And that turned the tide of that hill and that battle and that piece of land. Oh, that should put something in your stomach. Just how big is that guy? They might think it's Abraham came to protect you. They might think it's uh, big bouncers. They might think it's something else. They might think it's water walls, walls of water. But the truth of the matter is, when you're out of bullets, it's not your fight anymore. <laughs> Do your best. Defend. Fight. Fight the good fight. And keep going. Realize that you will overcome. I will overcome. The church will overcome. But I think we better prepare ourselves right now that when it looks like we're stuck between water and the world, it isn't going to be us that's going to be all wet at the end of the experience. Ye must overcome. Ye must. Which means ye must lean upon the Lord with all your heart, not upon your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and preach to yourself. I can do it. He can do it. I can do it. He can do it. You must overcome. 